I'm Pauline Yu, president of ACLS, and it's my distinct pleasure to be able to welcome you to the 2018 annual meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies. Our annual meeting combines constitutionally mandated governance sessions, reports on ACLS programs, and meetings such as the panel soon to follow, which are designed to delve into issues that confront um, academia today by bringing together delegates of our learned societies, their, the society executives, their elected uh, leadership, ACLS fellows, reviewers, board members, representatives of our college and university associates, uh, colleagues from our partner organizations, and friends, um, we aim to create an occasion for taking both a broad and a long view at the prospect, the prod the progress and the prospects of the humanities. It is the executive committee of the delegates that helps to design the annual meeting program. And certainly, the, it was their work that framed tonight's topic. And we've been very fortunate that such a distinguished group of panelists have, has accepted our invitation to speak tonight. I'm going to turn the mic over to Steve Smith, who is the Executive Director of the American Political Science Association, and will facilitate the session. Okay. Steve. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, we have a very distinguished panel here, and uh, their bios are all in your, in your program, so I am not going to introduce our panelists. Um, and to maximize the time we have for discussion, and we, we, we have had a, a conference call in advance of this, uh, this panel, and we've have some questions I'm going to ask the, the, the panel, and then we're going to try to also engage all of you in a Q&A um, uh, after we go through some of these questions. So, um, so the first question that I'd like to ask our panel is, our society has sharp political and cultural divisions. Many seek deliberately to incite divisive ideas and actions. How might academia respond to those strategies and seek to model constructive dialogue on difficult questions. Uh, I guess since I'm sitting right next to you, maybe, maybe okay. I can take a first stab at some of this. Um, I think a couple of things from my perspective. First of all, I've had a chance to kind of talk with a couple of colleagues about kind of the state of affairs right now. Mm -hmm. And one of my colleagues, a vice dean at George Washington University, Eric Arneson, has kind of described the state of play right now as we're living in an age of anger. Uh, where uh, kind of the smallest thing kind of sets us off because of uh, uh, a sense of entitlement that has kind of mushroomed over time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another colleague, um, William Eggington, Bill Eggington, is working on a book that should be coming out this summer called The Splintering of the American Mind. And in this book, one of the things he argues uh, is that um, we have lost a sense of commonwealth. That, and I don't know if I completely agree with all of the the uh, the insights that he's that he's putting, but it, putting forth. But there's some truth to some of this that that over the years our our, our focus on uh, on on identity politics has gotten us to a point uh, in time where uh, where the sense of commonwealth is kind of disaggregated. Um, I think that the role that that uh, that universities, learned societies. Uh, that, uh, that organizations like this have to play uh, in the future really revolves around three things, and they, they all pivot towards restoring a sense of civility uh, in, in, the, in the national dialogue. And the three things that, that I, at least in my mind, are, are, are important is that we as academics, to some extent, we own reflection. If we're able to turn around provocation into a more introspective, <laughs> reflective mode, if we can combat our, and, and, and actually take on provocateurs uh, uh, through, uh, through the lens of reflection and encouraging reflection in all the corners of our society, we have a, we have a, a, a means to, to improve the state of dialogue. Two, I also think that we as academics uh, very much like reflection. We are, in many ways, the owners uh, of, of context and, and being able to, to flesh out the, the larger parameters of, of any given story, of any given, uh, of any given discussion. Some of that's lost in our, modern, in our modern society. 
being able to go out there and to own and to teach and to inculcate uh, the need to have a deeper understanding of context, I think, is, is something else that we can do. And thirdly, I, I think that we don't need to be shy about doing these things. I think that we should be on the forefront getting out to the communities where, where the differences are most raw and rife. Uh, those, are the, those are the spaces uh, that where, where we're most needed. Uh, and that if we're going out there, we're engaging in research, and we're able to return the, what we find back to communities through a variety of media, through social media, through other types of uh, other forms of communication, uh, we are able to kind of, uh, we're able to channel and, and actually alter the conversation from within. Uh, and so um, those are some things that I, that, that I would think uh, are, is our role mm -hmm. in this particular moment. Well, if we're going in line, um, I'll say something that is probably uh, provocative, and we can get into a conversation about it uh, later. And that is, I think, a lot of all the stuff we're hearing about free speech it constitutes a kind of diversion from what is a more um, uh, compelling and uh, a, a dangerous problem, which is what we might call aggression's law of speech in which speech has become, in so many contexts and in so many ways, degraded. How to deal with the problem is not always clear, but I would like to read a, a very inspiring quote that really um, struck me. Quote, how can the university turn a blind eye to what every historian knows to be the key instrument of modern authoritarian regimes? the capacity to dress falsehood up as truth and reject the fruits of reasoned argument, evidence, and rigorous verification. That was a quote in the New York Times in a wonderful article in February of 2017 by Leon Botstein. <laughs> and, and so it seems to me that, <laughs> that how we can really focus on maintaining standards of speech in a way that is uh, robust. And as far as free speech or you know, uh, trolling by faculty members online, there are ways of dealing with such things short of firing people or uh, that sort of business. Uh, communities have, talking about communities have many forms of social control. And it seems to me that responding in a vigorous, rhetorically effective way and having the faculty members not missing in action so that it becomes a, 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 a sort of confrontation between students and administrators is really very important. And that's something, I won't go on and on about this, that maybe we can get uh, into a little more later. You want to jump the queue? Yeah, I want, I want to jump the line. Excellent. Uh, um, so uh, I'm, I'm, first, I'm delighted to be here. A really interesting uh, <laughs> audience. I, I want to share just a little biography just to um, share with you that I might be thinking about problems slightly differently. My undergraduate degree was in physics. I went to law school. Uh, I became a law professor and helped create the critical race studies concentration at UCLA. And worked there for, as an academic, uh, steadfastly avoiding service work. Not entirely shirking, but <laughs> avoiding it. Uh, until about 20 years in where I injected myself into senior management. And the reason why I want to focus on the fact that I'm now cutting at it as um, a vice chancellor uh, of equity, diversity, and inclusion is that I now have to handle or address these kinds of problems in a way that is not only academically inflected, but have to deal with the real-time operational necessities of managing a city-state in a time of great contentiousness. And I think the problems look different from different perspectives. And many of us are, again, uh, senior administrators or have been. and so. I think the context uh, from which we speak is important. Um, the question was, hey, how might we model and what is it that we might do given the divisiveness that exists? So I, I'm in largely in agree agreement with, the, um, with those suggestions that have already been made. But I want to say, one, I think modeling is just right. It, our job is to model the forms of engagement that we want to see in other people, not only our students, but other citizens. If other people are not demonstrating the terms of engagement, and it doesn't always have to be polite. I mean, civil it could mean lots of different things. It doesn't always have to be polite. Uh, it could be robust. Uh, but the point is, we must affirmatively model. And I think academics, uh, you know, 
if we think about reflection as being responsive or even reactive, I think we drop the we drop the ball. We have to affirmatively engage, create spaces, and demonstrate what it means to have a hard conversation across difference um, and show other people how it is done and not just wait uh, in recondite circles that no one would actually see. So that's one thing about modeling. Now, number two is, I think, clarity. And whether it's uh, viewed as reflection, context, it just, you know, having a mind is a blessing. Intelligence is, in some ways, a virtue. We have obligations to engage in problems using the minds that we actually have uh, developed. And I think, you know, in the law, we always say, look, are you disagreeing on the law? Are you disagreeing on the facts? Are you disagreeing with the law's application to the facts? Pick one, but at least understand why you disagree. Same thing with values and facts. Are you disagreeing with political commitments or, or facts? And have we no longer an overlapping political consensus? Is it that we're disagreeing uh, you know, with values, facts? Just get clarity. I think just the possibility that by paying attention to language, arguments, evidence, why it is we disagree slightly in a meta way, that commitment to clarity that requires us to be mindful, again, with communication and the ways that we think is part of the modeling we need to do. Um, I think those two things are uh, incredibly uh, important. And I, I know we'll be talking more about these things. I won't take more time. But again, modeling is exactly what we need to do. And I think emphasizing that it matters that we're at a university, that if you turn off your brain here, it's not an option, that that isn't the life that we are about, for better and worse. And so what does it mean to promote clarity through using our brains? So I don't think anybody in the room would find anything to disagree with what any of us have, has to say. And um, so, uh, you know, I totally think you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, but it doesn't really go to the problem. The most, most terrifying thing about the campus, from my point of view, is the silence and self-censorship, the fear that's on the campus. People want to avoid being hammered by social media. They want to avoid controversy. They want to get out of the way. And who wants to get out of the way? Our colleagues, whom we respect, want to get on with their work and stand away from the fire. Um, and um, particularly in the natural sciences, where, where there is um, seemingly less controversy, but tremendous assistance we could have in trying to establish what you would call the models. What, I, what, what worries me is not actually the issue of speech, free speech, or scholarly values. We have to come to terms with, I would say, there are four really overriding realities which concern me which are behind the issues that, we're, that we are seeing on a campus, the ones about free speech, free expression. The first is the undeniable economic catastrophe which has befallen the American university, both private and public. That is, say, the stripping of real funding, the lack of regard in the public arena among legislatures. The Congress does not have a single serious advocate of research of any kind even scientific research. And this is a long time in coming. It's not a function of the current administration. That we have allowed the university to be marginalized and privatized. So the University of Michigan, the University of California, Berkeley, they're not really public, they're semi-public universities. In the private sector, the inequality of wealth has led to a kind of narcissism of philanthropy. So you don't have, so you have a broad institute, you have some very rich institutions, but a lot of institutions competing for philanthropy in a world of glamour and fame where the calculus and the competition is very, um, is very hard to, to, to realize and compete with. In addition, given the rise of inequality of wealth, the rate of philanthropy has not risen equally. So you have, on the one hand, declining tax revenues and a disincentivization of the private support of scholarship. Who's going to step forward to create the new Courtauld Institute? Who's going to step forward to support, through private philanthropy, the kind of scholarly things we concerned about in the humanities? That's number two. We sit blindly by through an unbelievable continuing catastrophe of secondary and elementary schooling in the United States. 
And that schooling is not a matter of quality, it's also access, which is by race and economics. So you take the inequality of wealth, the absence of access to any decent secondary schooling, the proper desire to open access plugs into a broken, absolutely unsustainable, embarrassing um, uh, inequality of access to education within the population. And um, so taking those two factors, uh, it, we, this is a symptom of something which we are now being asked to fix when a student comes as a first year student who has no prior experience owing to his or her schooling with any serious preparation to do what this thing that we are expecting them to do. And finally, we have been unable to mount a real defense of what we stand for. We don't actually believe what we're doing. So there's a lot of very good careerism. You know, I have, I mean, I mean we're all in the, looking at people's dissertations and so forth and so on. Um, uh, and um, and, and the, the enterprise of the humanities and of basic science and also uh, uh, and, and of the social sciences, um, we have really done a poor job in connecting what we do to the conduct of life. So the distance between journalistic blah, blah from any CNN, Fox News, and actual serious understanding of race, inequality, and politics, that gap has widened. And we've really done not that much to help um, uh, improve that conversation. Uh, so we haven't defended ourselves. So in that context, where faculty members feel embattled about their jobs, the disappearance of certain fields, the cutting of budget fields. who's going to enter a debate like that? Who's going to come forward um, uh, the, that there's an embattlement, the reduction of number of full-time positions, all these economic factors, plus the fact that we as a university have been negligent, in my view, in really coming forward to, to attempt to fix the quality of secondary and primary schooling in the United States, leaving it to schools of education, which is as good enough to sending it to a morgue. <laughs> and so the fact is the faculty of arts and sciences have abandoned this, which is irresponsible. And so it seems to me this is a symptom of a deeper malaise, uh, which makes governing the campus very hard, because the accusations that free speech, million liberalism, is a kind of white man's oppressive club to which they've had no entrance, people have never seen that, is a perfectly reasonable argument. And our ability to mount a defense is weakened by these factors and by our complicit uh, ability to go along with the evisceration of our own enterprise and the tolerance of an unacceptable pre-higher education educational system. Does anybody? <laughs> well, so, uh, Drop I, 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 the I, mic you, and then we just go yeah. home, right? Well, yeah. I, I, I would just we, say that- Who would like to follow up? Yes, we, go ahead. We have a panel that is in very, very large agreement with one another. And I think probably we could all say, at least I can say, that I fully agree with Leon's analysis. The question is, uh, th and there are different ways that will take different lengths of time to address this, and some of us will be, be addressed in our roles as citizens and some in our roles as leaders of institutions or whatever, maybe to focus on what are some of the things over which we can and should exercise more immediate control. Mm -hmm. That is, what should we be doing like this week? Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. that's just what I'm right. So like, yeah, Gary, I, go ahead. I, I totally agree. I mean, obviously, we could have a diagnosis that is quite global, but we focus on the spheres of influence that we actually operate on. And I think the general diagnosis that was given, which is either malaise or deeply skeptical, might be spot on. That said, if uh, in the context of a polemic or a protest, a student starts yelling, hate speech is not free speech. Hate speech is not free speech. There is a moment of intervention. You could just say, look, as a matter of straight out description of positive law, lots of awful, horrendous hate speech is protected by our First Amendment. So in some sense, descriptively, you are wrong. If you wrote that on an essay in law school, you would do badly. You would do badly in front of a court. If you're talking to, again, you know, if, if 
If you're trying to persuade someone using the discourse that is required within a particular set of rules of engagement called the law, if you say hate speech is not free speech, in some sense you're wrong. Now, of course, it's important to clarify. That which is is not the same thing as that which ought to be. The is-ought distinction is really important. And to be actually too willing to describe the status quo as is and unchangeable might lead us not to appreciate the contingency of all law in all kinds of ways. You could have that conversation. But step number one is say, you're wrong. Number two is maybe we should change it. Maybe it's contingent. But be get better in the terms of engagement. Now, when I respond, is is different from ought, that actually has nothing to do with whether or not we have enough dollars within the university system or whether or not we have good school lunch programs. I think all these are true, but it does focus on things that we have to deal with right now in specific instances. I'm going to borrow <laughs> Judith's thing. You know, I, you know, we're just simply talking heads, but I think many of us actually run, run a, a, a real situation. So um, I, I have never succeeded by telling an angry student what the law is. <laughs> never. Because given the tradition of civil disobedience and telling them they're breaking the law is to give them uh, praise. Because the law must be bad. You follow me? So that's useful. What is useful? So you want to be practical? What is useful? Is we're not about free speech, and that's Judith's point. We're not about free speech. We're about a different level of speech, which is about inquiry in the rules, of, which means there's no such thing in a university, in my view, of, of a hit-and-run speech. I can't get on a podium, say X, and say goodbye. I have to hear everybody telling me I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. So I tell you the Earth is flat, and I've got all kinds of charts and pictures. I can dress it up. Then some physicists are going to get up, and they're going to say, so what about this? What about that? And they're going to expose me as a charlatan right on the stage. And I can't say I'm too busy. I've got to go. So in the university, there's no one-way speech. There's no throwing balls out and running off. But, but so I, that's, that's the kind of standard of discourse, which actually students can quite begin to understand, I, I, got, I got that, I got that. So you can't come and talk without response. But to so, put these two things together, if, if I'm, I'm sorry, if no? I, if I no. may, now let's just say that uh, how you deal with a hysterical student in the moment is one thing. But how you try to enculturate students, let's say, into really having a conversation about free speech is you maybe have a panel, and maybe you have a lawyer, and maybe you have someone else, and then maybe you start students thinking about, gee, what is the First Amendment in the United States? How do we approach hate speech as opposed to, say, Western European democracies? This is called Let's Learn Something. And you actually say, gee, if you're Floyd Abrams, you really like, you argue for why you really like ours better, except then you've got to say to your friends who no longer speak to you why you defended Citizens United before the Supreme Court. So here, everybody is busy learning what's at issue in free speech matters. And then, as far as what Leon said is very interesting, is what kind of ground rules do you have when people come to campus? Leaving aside the fact that really there is a difference between Charles Murray and Milo Yiannopoulos, and if you're wanting to have one, you really don't need to have the other, um, you might say, gee, when you come and speak here, you have to take questions, or something along those lines. And you recognize different kind of speech yeah. events. On the one hand, you've got uh, commencement, which is basically a ritual. So maybe you have someone there who represents and embodies the values of the institution. It's mostly about the kids and their family. The other end, you have a faculty member who can invite anyone because of academic freedom, which we'll get to later, um, uh, to their classroom to speak. Ben, do you want to? I'm just enjoying <laughs> this. Okay. This is, this is great. <laughs> Leon, yeah. go ahead. Uh, this is all very nice, but, but let's get, this is all very nice. It's but, more than nice. Uh, it's very much. It's, right. it's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> But it isn't quite, because the offense is not really hate speech. The offense ranges from, uh, s from the perception that you are um, doing something that's harmful to another person. And what that subjective sense of what's harmful is very varied. But look at our own community. Let's be honest. I'm scared of those cameras, but let's be honest. <laughs> we, in the name of Hannah Arendt, happen to be a teacher of mine, we have a Hannah Arendt Center. 
And she was, she's buried in the Bard campus. And we have a, okay, and we invited a student of, former rejected student of Peter Sloterdijk's, who is a member of the Alternative für Deutschland party, at a conference about such a topic, right? In, he gave a talk. Ian Baruma, now the editor of the New York Review of Books, a member of our faculty at the time, right, was his interlocutor. And people could get up from the floor. We were then excoriated by your colleagues in a petition by people who hadn't been there, hadn't seen it, and then Masha Gessen lies in the New York Review books by never mentioning that Ian Baruma was, her inter was his interlocutor, making it believe that we rolled out this proto-fascist, gave a microphone, and therefore endorsed him. You follow me? So the truth wasn't told, and a petition by people from every university in the world signing on, excoriating us. Now, my view is they can go to hell, but I am a veteran. If I were a president in my 30s or 40s, and I was trying to make a career in the American Academy, what would the lesson I'd learn would be? Stay away. The worst possible lesson, the lesson that the German academics in the 30s took in, in accommodating, and the failure of our own colleagues, tenured professors, not to say we just, we, we, you know, they didn't even know what they're talking about. And a petition, a chronicle, higher education, a whole, whole Hubble, thank God in the era of, of modern media, the half-life of the significance of these events is minuscule, <laughs> you know? So it's irrelevant. But it was an embarrassment. I was embarrassed for the academic community. So what do you not so, for a disagreement, so, so, so but for a failure to describe so, the situation. So Leon, so what, what's, what are the concrete steps here? And, and also academic associations now are getting drawn into this in terms of def, def, uh, either being asked to take one side or the other. So what, what, what are the concrete steps to address this? Uh, get the facts right and defend precisely this kind of academic speech. A, a person with a PhD in philosophy who is now, a, a, let's, call him, let's call him a modern neo someone we don't like, who holds conservative, anti-immigrant, anti-migrant, racist views, right? He spoke, and somebody who's written a book, knowledge about this, has debated with him in the public forum. And one of the teachers, thank God for Francine Prose, who said her students learned more from that debate than from reading all the right opinions. So it was an educational experience. Why didn't our colleagues defend us, but wanted to look good to some constituency out there in which they wanted, by signing their name to a petition, to look liberal and anti-fascist? Okay. Ben. So, so Leon, this, this is all, as I said, this is, this is incredible uh, information, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving how it's being presented here. But I, I do want to—I do want to get at something here. What do you think lies at the root of why those students or those colleagues are are engaged in those particular actions that that really are that, that, that are behind uh, and setting and actually setting you off? I mean, I, I wonder when you peel the onion. There's what is it that's that that's at the root? Why why you think? Yeah, yeah. My personal opinion is that we have gotten such a low self-image of ourselves as irrelevant yeah. that uh, we seek approbation uh, through kind of uh, identities as being on the progressive side of history or some, some weird thing like that, so that, um, that we have so few opportunities to be in the public eye in some significant way. Uh, we live in a terrible time, in my view, where the power of money and fame is overriding uh, uh, without any, any, any religious or cultural limitations on it, that um, it's simply thoughtlessness. On, on, it's, it's both insecurity and so thoughtlessness, fear of being accused and not being on the right side. I, I don't quite understand why people do that. Uh, it, it's hard, hard to understand. It took me by surprise, I would say. I didn't organize a conference. I was a you know, bystander, but, but I was flabbergasted. But I wonder, sorry. Go ahead. I wonder okay. what you can do about this. For example, I remember when some racist, stupid cartoon was published in a, a, a newspaper actually at Columbia. Um, and the stu African American students and their um, uh, allies had put masking tape over their mouths and were walking around, and maybe you can help me, 
what should one have done here, um, with signs that said, I feel silenced. And so that's about what does it mean, you know, when you feel vulnerable and afraid and this and that, except they didn't look, at total, but they were, I feel silenced. I wanted them to walk around with signs that said, we had a civil rights movement here not that long ago, and why do I still have to put up with this crap? In other words, you just, what can you do, or the faculty, if you talk to them, what's the matter with you people, your tenured faculty members? Okay, you feel frightened, compared to what? Compared to serving in Syria? I mean, is there a way that you, and, and a sense of humor I have found will oh. sometimes help. But is there a way, it's inexcusable for these secure faculty members not to show more guts. Look, we, we, I'll give you another example. We had a person who was invited at philosophy to give a philosophical lecture. In his biography, it showed that he had worked for the Mossad in his past. What? He's an Israeli citizen who worked for the Mossad. Group of students exercised their right to stand up in front of the speaker with signs, essentially accusatory signs that he has blood on his hands and so forth and so on. This person elected, I understand emotionally, I'm, I'm a musician, which means if I got up to play and some people you know, had signs up, you know, um, you know, cruel, talentless, moron, you know, even if they were silent, didn't shout such compliments, I would be deterred from going on. I would say, no. I'll play another day, you know, I'll walk off stage. This person, politely just said, listen, I I'm trying to give a philosophical paper. It was on some kind of social theoretical matter. He'd done a PhD, you know, in an academic field. The idea that we have a culture in which, because of the internet, your past is never forgotten. Charles Murray wasn't coming to Middlebury to talk about the bell curve, which he had written 20 years before. Which scientist do we know who hasn't published on me 20 years ago that she finally thought that was wrong? You know, I and when I hear a scientist talk, I'm interested to see what they're new, what, they're, what they have to say that was different from what I read in their papers. But there's no tolerance of that. So we're, then this poor guy, I don't know what his views of Israel, Palestine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are. Were they relevant? He actually was emotionally, it was impossible for him to speak. No member of the faculty got up in front of their own student and said, look, you made your point, can you stand in the back? Not right in front? Not a single person. Speakers can come onto campus uh, for all kinds of reasons. Some of it is effectively a public forum. It's just a park, it's a street, it's a sidewalk. They can come and shout at uh, passersby. They can be invited by students. They can be inv invited by academic units. Frankly, third parties could just rent space because it's stage space and we, uh, we need to make uh, dollars. So lots of people can actually come in. We, we have actually, and, and I'm going back to maybe the things that are much more tactical and banal. We now actually, more or less, uh, when, whenever there's actually uh, um, uh, say, actual knowledge of a student protest or any kind of protest, we actually give clear rules of engagement. And it might seem kind of silly, but we say the following. We say, one, uh, we uh, respect uh, the freedom to speak and the freedom to protest, which is also part of the First Amendment. Two, but uh, if you disrupt so much that you effectively silence a speaker from reaching a willing audience, that won't stand. And three, uh, you'll be asked, a couple times nicely, but then you'll ultimately be escorted out of the room. And if you're escorted out of the room, you're subject to arrest, and there may be consequences. So we now actually, in a far more explicit way mm -hmm. than we did just a couple sure. years ago, explicitly tell people, you can protest. It's OK to stand up. It's OK to be in the corner. It could be other kinds of stuff. But if you are screaming and heckling in such a way that you prevent a speaker from communicating to a willing audience, you know, you're going to be asked to leave. He's right. So Real rules are help. Real and rules. And notice helps, especially because people ought to know that if, if they don't know what the consequences are, in part because there is a, you know, an overly idealized, heroic conception of what, you know, what 
what civil disobedience is, and, and people forgot that there are actually consequences to civil disobedience in different kinds of ways. Uh, I think, again, in a, in a campus where we're anxious about DACA, about international mm -hmm. visa status, people need to know what it means to be casually arrested. There are unintended consequences, and we thought it would not be actually uh, kind uh, uh, for us to actually engage in these practices without very clear notice. That, I have to say, has helped a lot in, yeah. the, terms of, in the rules of engagement. There are little things. But I think we have to get to a place where, uh, again, to celebrate, again, the ability to protest, but to recognize that, again, there is a heckler's veto that we don't tolerate. And then, of course, you should always use your own voice box to make clear what your own values are, notwithstanding the fact that you'd have to fight to allow very you know, disgusting speakers who are just interested in celebrity, right? Uh, coming in and saying awful things just to troll an overly sensitive left. If that's what the strategy is, of course, in some sense, we as a public institution have to allow it to happen. On the other hand, I speak very forcefully about exactly what that play is and stand for a set of values. Okay. And, and so, Jerry, it, it, you seem to imply by your comments that the university was also was a quite different public space than Times Square or Hyde Park Corner, because it, there's yeah. specific rules that you could put in place. Yeah. yeah. So how much does this cost you? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, if you think about all the numbers that, uh, that are public from Berkeley, right, whether you're dealing with Marlo Yiannopoulos, their free speech right. week, other kinds of stuff, it's, it's huge. Uh, now, one never speaks bad of sister campuses. We've been more fortunate in other kinds of ways, but we've managed it in a particular kind of way, but we have to be mindful of how at the very, just, just the operational security costs and how it is we suck up certain security costs because we can't allow hostility to pass through to shut down a speaker, whether on left or right, but recognizing that that could be a, a spigot that never, ever shuts off. So we're, we're actually incredibly actively developing the rules of engagement and policies and whatnot. And I can give details, but I guess my point is these are the kinds of nitty-gritty questions that have to be answered before the fact, not after the fact. And in the university, I think it does matter. I mean, again, we can have interesting conversations about public versus private, whether the First Amendment applies or not. Again, academic freedom is a set of virtues that, and values that apply across both public and private spheres. But I think the university matters because it is a site that is meant to do different work than just the public sphere, right? It has to always have a balance of both private and public, both safe and brave. And it is fundamentally a pedagogical place where we're supposed to engage in certain kinds of practices that lead us through the university to a place of greater self-reflection or enlightenment. Right. As I'm listening to this conversation and thinking about the experiences at George Washington University and other institutions where I've had some familiarity with, uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that leaps to my mind right now is that as we do engage in the, the acts of creating rules or creating responses and, and trying to uh, trying to navigate uh, the conversations into, uh, into a new future and a better future, what I'm constantly reminded of is as, as we actually engage in those actions, what I'm seeing are two things. One is an incredible unpredictability of, of the responses of, of the communities and where, where, and where we are articulating these, these types of responses, which, which begs to me uh, a the need for an, a, a type of administrative acumen that, that is more elastic, more flexible, that um, as we create rules, as we create the new modes of engagement, that we need to have a, a, a self-reflexive self kind of mm -hmm. uh, tone embedded into that because, quite frankly, we don't know what, 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 how, what the responses are going to be. Um, and I think our predictive capacity has, has declined uh, over time. I, I'm, I'm persuaded by, by, by your, 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 or at least um, your, your reflection on why the, why the silence. Mm -hmm. Who could have predicted that? We, we, our students and our communities are at a place of new vulnerability that, that, we, um, that we are only beginning to understand. Uh, we don't know, to me, uh, in, in some ways, um, all of the pain points. And so that, that must create in us uh, a more agile uh, form, of, uh, form, of, uh, form of administrative, uh, administrative mindfulness and, and action. So just wanted to, to put that out there. No, I think you're totally right. Uh, the humor part is the improvisation, the rules being what they are. Uh, uh, the ability to um, 
not to tr be trapped into a, into a defensive, um, hostile position. Uh, it's very time consuming. So we have an alumnus uh, who is a right-wing blogger, a uh, disreputable one. Um, but we minted him ourselves. Um, and um, he, he dilutes the liberal reputation of the institution. And he has credentials in the West Wing. And um, he uh, was reinvited to campus. And it took us exactly what your point, the flexibility. It took us hours and hours and hours of very careful discussion with people who were worried about his arrival on campus, felt offended by the fact that he was being invited, and so forth and so on. And it went by without incident. He spoke, and there were counter events. And the good news, so let me say the good news, is I'm not sure how much our undergraduates ever take away from their classroom experience. So I've always thought the best teaching comes in the connection between what we nominally teach in the classroom and their real life experience. So these issues are fantastic and welcome opportunities to teach fundamental notions of philosophical notions, about ethics, about law, about history, about politics, about race, the whole mm -hmm. gamut of things that we supposedly are in control of. We have a golden opportunity to make the intellectual tradition, which we are the custodians of, useful. So in a way, it's a welcome. I mean, what you call the flexibility and the non-predictability gives you an opportunity to do an immense amount of teaching out of the classroom. If only we could mobilize the faculty to realize this is an opportunity, not something to walk away from. We are actually, in order to succeed, we have to return the undergraduate faculty to the idea that their obligations as undergraduate faculty is not limited to their classes and office hours. That they're teachers. In they're other. teachers in the conduct of daily life in the connection to their discipline in some way, by example. Um, so the, the issue of academic freedom and free speech. So we've been. You were just giving an example of issues around academic freedom, and, but certainly there's also been a lot of issues around free speech in um, particularly individual faculty now with free speech rights of individual faculty. Yeah. And so what, to what extent is academic freedom different than free speech? It, it's different because academic freedom occurs in the context, and that is very much the business of, of scholarly associations and the ACLS, it exists in the context of norms and professional responsibilities. That doesn't mean they never change. That doesn't mean they're perfect. Sometimes, you know, something happens and you have to change something. But there are standards. You enjoy academic freedom by uh, adhering to certain professional standards? So I think it's a very good question. So I would distinguish in the following way. What we deal with now in the American campus is not strictly academic freedom questions. It is only indirectly. The people's scholarly work are, is rarely contested on the campus, very rarely contested. Um, and, uh, but it is whom they invite or what kind of speakers. Academic freedom, um, in my experience, which is limited, I now speak as chairman of the board of the Central European University in Budapest. Mm -hmm. So I'm chairman of that board, and with Michael Ignatieff, we've been involved in what I think is a real academic freedom question, which is against the government, right. which is government control of the academic substance of what is done in university. So the characterization of the Central European University, not as a graduate faculty in the social sciences, but as an agent of liberalism, you know, as a kind of political actor, and to defend um, the freedom of research, hiring practices, and the real autonomy of the university against the state. Um, that's academic freedom of a classic kind, mm -hmm. uh, which AUP was founded to defend. Also, the defense against moneyed interests. That would be the other real threat to academic freedom. So a donor comes in and says, I want this taught, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and it happens, trust us. Uh, and, uh, you know, that does happen. But um, I think it's a little different. I don't think that what occupies the undergraduates or students, the American campus, is strictly academic freedom. I think it is because in the elective system, they can accept 
again, it's pedagogy. So trigger warnings, uh, question of, um, which I think are perfectly reasonable things. We had trigger warnings when I was an undergraduate. I don't understand what people are all exercised about. Mm -hmm. Safe spaces. What was Hillel House? It was a safe space in a WASP university for a Jew like me. Mm -hmm. So why are we complaining about the, there should be safe spaces. I didn't go into it because I didn't need their safe space. I had less in common with the people in Hillel House than the rest of the people outside. So it wasn't for me, but it was a good idea. And so both trigger warnings. People said, read this book. It has a lot of, a lot of people die, people get killed, somebody's beheaded, and it has an unhappy ending. I'm in the opera business. We give a trigger warning. It's called the libretto. A summary of the plot. Let somebody be shocked that Tosca jumps off the, you know, in the end of the story. They know ahead of time. So what's everybody upset that the right wing press leading us by the nose? Nothing wrong with it. So those are not strictly academic freedom questions. They're pedagogy questions. Can I, you know, my, my view is just, again, it depends on what kinds of vocabularies we're using. I mean, freedom of speech is connected to the First Amendment. It's a constitutional right vis-a-vis -vis the state. So again, federal government, state government. And it really, the core of it is that it's, the government has a hard time picking sides. Of course, it could sometimes pick sides, but if it tries to shut up one side because of its content, that's a huge problem. And that's the core of the freedom of speech. Academic uh, freedom, the way I understand it, and it could be understood in so many different ways, it's, it really is a commitment to the freedom to inquire. What does it mean to actually have the autonomous right to ask the hardest questions and figure out your version of truth? That set of values, although it's connected to the First Amendment, in some sense is largely independent of it, that set of values you can put up against a donor, against an administrator, it doesn't really matter whether they have state power, even if they don't have the monopoly of force. It is the question, am I allowed to inquire? intellectually what interests me and find out what I deem to be my version of truth. Those are very different, they're related, but they're actually very different. The only thing that I want to emphasize is that in the context of academic freedom, I just want to make clear, as people exercise their academic freedom, on a daily basis, tenure committees deny people tenure because their version, because we're making judgments about the content, right? If you plagiarize, for example, or if you're uninteresting, or if you lack style, or if you say things that are stupid, these are all content judgments we make day in and day out. So on the one hand, in the First Amendment, it's, you're not supposed to actually pick winners and losers in terms of content. In the university, we do it all the time. We give A pluses for great essays on the basis of content. And so we have to recognize that in some domains, picking winners and losers on the basis of the content is something that we ought to be anxious about. On the other hand, in the university, we do it all the time. And we actually make judgments about whether something is good, novel, interesting all the time while balancing this kind of idea that you could do it in your own way and inquire your version of truth. And again, if a discipline is sufficiently Catholic with a small c, you'll see different versions of that flourishing. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me give one example where we all in this room could do a put, step forward to be practical. The issue that I think we can be most helpful with is the misunderstanding of cultural appropriation. A white person talking about the African-American experience, a non-Jew writing about the Holocaust, Alexis de Tocqueville writing about democracy in America, uh, Rimsky Korsakov writing Capriccio Español, right? There is confusion about what the ethics of that are and what that's about. And we certainly have the resources mm -hmm. to deepen the conversation. I believe the undergraduates are perfectly ready to have that conversation of what means, uh, why is it that um, there is something, there's a complicated story about Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin. There is, um, there is uh, not, uh, there is it, the finest story student of Eastern European and Central European Jewish folk music is a non-Jewish scholar, Philip Bowman. Philip Bowman. Um, that doesn't bother me. I mean, there's kind of, uh, that's why the prior education is so weak. We need to rethink the first year curriculum in the light of these debates 
in order to bring students to a position by which they can formulate positions on their own, not simply borrow cliches from either the internet or the public conversation. Um, on that note, we're going to have to thank the, the panelists. Thank you. It was a pleasure.